everybody. This is Bonnie Vandermulen, Training Coordinator for Wisconsin Facets. On behalf of our entire Wisconsin Facets staff, I'd like to thank you for joining us today. Our webinar today is working with First Nations students with IEPs. Our presenters today are Eva Kavinsky and David O'Connor. Eva is a school administration consultant on the special education team at the Wisconsin Department of Public Instruction. One of her areas of responsibility is supporting American Indian students with IEPs. David O'Connor is the American Indian Studies Program Coordinator Consultant at the Wisconsin Department of Public Instruction. Mr. O'Connor is originally from and is a member of the Bad River Band of the Lake Superior Chippewa Ojibwe in northern Wisconsin. It gives me great pleasure today to introduce to you both Eva and David. Thank you, Bonnie. Hello, everybody. Thank you for taking the time to join us and explore some of the issues related to working with American Indian students with IEPs. It's always an interesting audience when it comes to FACETS presentations because part of you are probably coming in as parents, others are coming in as educators. So we're going to try to straddle both sides of the fence there, but if not, um, please accept our apologies. The, um, I, before we go any further, I'd also like to um, introduce my colleague, Bakwanigawid, David O'Connor. Da um, David, can you please tell, tell the folks about yourself? Certainly, just uh, first and foremost, good afternoon, everyone. As you just heard, my name is Bakwanigawid, David G. O'Connor. Bakwanigawid is my traditional Anishinaabe name, which means broken wing. When I translate, um, which in English means broken wing, uh, the meaning behind that name means he never gives up, he overcomes. <clears throat> I appreciate the opportunity to be in a space with you and to learn with you, as well as the opportunity to co-present with my colleague, Eva Kabinski. Good afternoon. Thank you, David. Uh, part of the reason that we, uh, David, you want to slide to the next, advance to the next one. Uh, part of the reason that David and I came up with this presentation and we continue to do this presentation is because we're still seeing American Indian students who are not reaching where, where we would expect them to be academically, behaviorally, um, functionally. And part of the reason can be because of a, a not understanding a st the student that you're working with. Part of, um, I, I had the privilege of working with uh, American Indian education programs in a six state area, Bureau of Indian Education um, Schools and the uh, U.S. Department of Education's Office of Indian Education as a technical assistance provider. I then was given the, the again, the honor to, to um, work as a school psychologist for the Menominee Indian School District here in Wisconsin. And one thing that I kept running into and that you know teachers kept coming back to me, you know, we've been working with a student, they are, you know, we know that there's something going on in terms of a processing difficulty, but they're coming up as having an intellectual disability on some of the assessments. But we know that that's not the case because we've worked with the student. And so one of the things that we determined was that some of the assessment measures uh, that we were using were not appropriate for the students in that school district. And the reason we were able to do that was because the teachers really knew that student. I got a chance to really know that that student and a couple of others where we were seeing these discrepancies between what the test was telling us and what we were seeing in real life. And a big part of that was just knowing the student and understanding some of the racial and cultural issues that, that came up within that community, within that nation, and just how that wasn't always recognized or, uh, or didn't, wasn't taken into account by the test developers. So what David and I are hoping to do today is to both give those of you who are here as educators some ideas of what, what you might want to do in terms of involving parents of American Indian students to make sure that you really get a chance to look and see who the student is. And then also for those of you who are parents, 
uh, you know, if you, especially if you are American Indian parents, things that you might be able to help share when it comes to your student to make sure that when we're looking at a student's ability, that we're looking at a true disability and disability related needs as opposed to differences. And there's a lot of issues that kind of can impact that. So um, David, if you could move to the next one. So why are we here again? Even though American Indian students are provided the same mainstream curriculum and educational experiences, they're, they're taught to the same standards, they don't always end up as being as academically successful as their non-peers. And in, in this one, I know it's not very easy to see the numbers. Um, this came actually off of our uh, WISE dash, which is the data um, dashboard that we have at DPI. And when we're looking at American Indian students and we're looking for those for those in terms of the purple, we want purple or blue, which are the proficient and advanced. American Indian students, when it came to in English language arts from uh, K th grades three through eight, we're only seeing 13.3% of American Indian students are proficient. And as opposed to their white peers who are uh, almost 40% uh, higher because, uh, because of the uh, being proficient and advanced. And uh, so it's really, if, if this were because there, uh, there was a true difference. I, I mean, if, if they're, they, there's, we would expect to see uh, similar frequencies in terms of how how many students are proficient and advanced. So something else is happening here. Something else is going on that is uh, not not allowing these students to demonstrate proficiency the same way that their white peers and other peers are. Um, next one, please. So again, we're here to try to share some important information that will hopefully help create common understandings and communities between educators, families, and students. Next one, please. David will now kind of review some of the topics that we're going to be sharing. So as you can see on the screen, folks, a couple different topics that we'll be talking throughout our time here this afternoon, early this early this afternoon, is around uh, misconceptions and stereotypes of Indigenous students, as well as working with students and families and communities, as well as our nation. Have an opportunity to uh, briefly touch up on uh, sovereignty, specifically around tribal sovereignty. Have an opportunity also to talk about what are some things we'd like to look forward forward to in terms of building uh, respect as well as trust as well as an overview of our native nations of our state here in the here in the state of Wisconsin. And so these will be the topics that we'll be briefly touching, at, touching on throughout our time here this afternoon. So in terms of some common misconceptions and stereotypes, a lot of times when you have conversations with educators and other different folks, stakeholders across the state of Wisconsin, a lot of times these are common things that we would hear about indigenous people. So a lot of times I always hear, all American Indians live on reservations. Well, that's not the case, actually. In Wisconsin, in the state of Wisconsin, 40% of uh, of our Native people live on reservations. 60%, like myself, I live in Madison, Wisconsin, or Milwaukee, or Green Bay, live off reservation. Nationwide, it's actually 70% of all Native people live off reservation, and 30% um, live on reservations, as example. All in terms of another common misconception and stereotype what we hear frequently is that all Native people receive what we call per cap or stipends from their tribal government due to their gaming establishments that they have. Um, there is some nations that are able to do that. That's, that's part of their sovereign right to determine what is best for their, their members of their nation. Um, not all nations are able to do that due to maybe not for um, economic opportunities, whatever the case may be, but not all nations in our state are able to do that um, based on either not having as high uh, numbers of funding or whatever case may be due to where they're located, all the different things as example. I always hear that a lot of times that all of, all of the First Nations students get free college education. I would definitely encourage you to contact my, uh, my student loan processor and see if that is the case. They would probably give you a big smile and maybe laugh. That is definitely not the case by any means. 
um, as someone who's, it's, but I put it as an investment into my life in terms of what are some things I like to get in terms of paying for my college tuition. Also quite a bit, a lot of times I always hear that there is only one Native American culture. That is not the case. There is, we are, you know, over 574 federally recognized nations. We're over 60 plus state recognized nations across the United States. And in Wisconsin, we're home to 12 nations. And so I always try to tell people when you talk about indigenous culture, it's cultures. So I pluralize it on purpose, just like when I talk about histories, it's Native, Native American histories or indigenous histories. So I pluralize that on all purpose. As well as all indigenous people are deeply connected to the environment and animals, as well as we all know each other. I always say these are common misconceptions that we consistently hear, as well as stereotypes about how Native people across our state, as well as elsewhere. A good example of that a lot of times is when we get an opportunity to do, um, uh, if you ever get a chance, I would strongly encourage you to do this. Go to a search engine like Google or Bing or Yahoo, whatever the case may be. And you could type in different demographics, different racial groups as example. And so when you type in American Indian, a lot of times um, into that section, it's always historical imagery. It's always very male driven. And if you do see contemporary images in there, it's always in what we call polar regalia or outfits as example. And so when you look at other demographics, you may, it, it's very different, like black or African American, Hispanic or Latinx or Asian American as example. Those are all very contemporary images and that you would consistently see very much like this as example. It's a very contem uh, contemporary imagery, mix of men and women, et cetera, all the way through as example. And so some, and as many of you know, this is off an algorithm. So whatever you put it, whatever we put into the internet and specifically into those search engines, these are what populate up. And so when you think about having contemporary voice, here's a lost opportunity where that's not, be, not, be, not the case if we don't have not seen as being your neighbors, your teacher, your lawyer, doctor, lawyer, whatever the case may be, in terms of who we are, in terms of being in your communities, here in your community itself or across the state, or across the United States, as example. So what's the impact of these misconceptions? Well, you know, as we, as we see these images repeated, these ideas and stereotypes repeated, we begin to develop biases and it's especially dangerous when it comes to not having any real life connections i always give the example that you know my mother had the my mother came from poland uh, in the late in the early 1960s and her only exposure to american indians were through some trips that we took especially through the southwest where we drove through some of the pueblos and some of the reservations there. And her perception was that all American Indians, that especially those who live on reservations, are abjectly poor, do not have any resources, that it's a dangerous place, and just really had some very stereotypical perceptions. But when I did get my, get my job with the Menominee Indian School District, she came up with me just to see where I was working. And she was just so happy when she saw the sign saying, welcome to the Menominee Nation. And she was like, oh, they don't call themselves a reservation. They call themselves a nation. And she was impressed with, you know, just the beauty of the area. And it, it was a complete change for her. And so, you know, and suddenly she became very aware of what's going on. But until then, she had jumped to conclusions based on what she had had experience with and what she thought she knew and what she had been taught. What's dangerous about this is when it comes to students, those biases can impact how we interpret their actions. You know, one example I had was I had a student who was very quiet. He did not, um, he did not volunteer. He did not provide, you know, he, he he basically was a very quiet person. And so teachers assumed that he didn't care, that he wasn't engaged, that, you know, that school didn't mean anything to him. Well, it turns out that he needed to be quiet in order to process the information coming in because he was having a lot of trouble being able to bring it in and then utilize it. And he wasn't, he was very, he very much wanted to be successful academically, but but you know this was what he had to do in order to try, you know try and be successful and we only found this out when we did an evaluation and we started asking him questions about how, how he did things and 
you know, what did and didn't work for him. So again, you know, this could have been a student lost that, you know, everybody would have given up on when really it was a student who was just looking for a way to access instruction in a way that made sense to him. Okay, if you could go to the next one, David. So how can we fight stereotypes, stereotypes and, and biases? I was asked once to do to review some test items for um, the dynamic learning maps assessment. And it was a, a story about uh, um, just touching upon American Indians in history and in the United States. And uh, as I'm going through it, they talk about, you know, and there are American Indians today, but they, as David mentioned, the only picture they had was of a, a gentleman in his powwow regalia. And certainly there are people who, who are both dancers that would be participating in ceremonies and powwows, but the rest of the time they don't wear that, that regalia. I, I was so frustrated by this that I actually was going to go and take a picture of Mr. O'Connor and uh, send that to the test developer saying, okay, here's what an, a, a modern day American Indian person looks like. But because they were, in, you know, for them, that was what they thought that that person was supposed to look like, they had included that picture. So to fight that, we need to get to know families. We need to get to know students, we need to get to know the community so that you're not going in and assuming things about students based upon how they act or how they look, but that you actually have real information. And then the other thing that's super important is to get to know yourself and how you think about different groups of people, because you might be surprised. I, uh, I was and I wasn't when I really started taking a closer look at what my biases and stereotypes were because I knew that that happened, but I had hoped I was, that I'd had enough uh, um, experience and opportunity to have fewer of them, but they're still there and I'm still, I still work for it. Uh, for, the, for the next one, for the next slide, I'm gonna turn it back over to David to talk about sovereignty. So one thing I want to emphasize as we think about sovereignty folks, a lot of times when I have this conversation with folks, especially about what does that mean? So sovereignty at its base roots is the right to self-rule. When you think about tribal sovereignty, it is inherent right to self-rule. And so when I think about what does that mean? So as a dual citizen of this nation, I exercise my rights. Anytime I go vote or pick up prescription drugs, or whatever the case may be, I always exercise my right as a dual citizen by sharing my tribal ID as an example in terms of um, exercising those rights. So I always remind people why I'm a dual citizen, but it's even more importantly, as, or example as well, it's also a political identity. And so when I think about what does that mean specifically, how that relates to my my rights as, uh, as an Ojibwe person, first and foremost, as well as a US citizen as well. So in terms of why is it important to recognize sovereignty? And it's, as he indicates, I'm gonna just go over these couple, three bullet points real quick. It is a factor that, that impacts the lives of our indigenous students, even if they are on, on the reservation or off the reservation, as we just talked about a moment ago, where the vast majority of our indigenous people do not live on the reservation. It impacts the way we may interact with our tribal leaders, as well as governments, as well as agencies, or organizations that we may have relationships or partnerships with across our state. As I mentioned earlier, Wisconsin, we are home to 12 individual nations um, in terms of 11 of those are federally recognized one is not currently federal or state recognized but definitely want to make sure that their voice is included in this space as well and then most importantly also why is this why is important why is uh, sovereignty important because it also grounds us in the here and now and so when you think about what does that mean specifically about i always tell people that as, as sovereign nations we have a huge impact on the state historically as well as contemporary even as example, and you think about just, I'll just always show out some facts as example, in 72 counties across Wisconsin, tribal nations or our are, 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 are nations themselves directly uh, have the largest employment in 10 counties out of 72. That's one every seven counties in the state of Wisconsin 
where we have um, a significant impact on individuals or families or communities in those areas. And I want to emphasize about six, 70 to 75 percent of those individuals that work at our tribal enterprises or businesses are non-tribal members. So not only do we make an impact on our nation's members themselves, but those outside of our communities as well. And so with that being said, I'm going to turn it back over to Eva to talk about respect and trust. Yes. So, you know, again, going back to this whole issue of sovereignty and stereotypes, it's, it is important, as David said, to recognize that tribal nations are sovereign entities, and therefore they do have an elevated status. Understanding and sharing will promote that respect because there's been a lot of disrespect to many of the, the citizens of our American Indian nations over the years and even today. And providing respect is not how many indigenous communities have been treated in the past. And just to then add to that, it's not how many American Indian adults were treated. So I'll turn this back over to David. So, and so as we think about moving forward, one of the areas that we also want to build on is thinking about how words matter and language matters. And so as we talk about, uh, so we talked about representation mattering, now we're talking about words mattering. And so this actually comes from a thing um, called the radical copy editor. And so as you can see in those little bubbles up there, they talk about different words or phrases that have been used in the past, or maybe even today, in many cases where I've heard these terms used, mm -hmm. um, and how they impact our work with our families and communities and nations across our state, which has a direct impact on our work with students. So I'm gonna read what's under the, underneath those bubbles in that one on the image on the left. Language is a vessel of cultural stories, values, and norms. In the United States, everyday language perpetuates the oppression of different demographics such as indigenous people. Native people or indigenous people exist and deserve respect like any other group of people that are not that they are not historical artifacts, caricatures or mascots. Practice the truth by questioning origins of words that we use. So as a few words that we see throughout here off the reservation or why don't we go do a rain dance or Geronimo or they're on a war path. So terms I even still hear quite frequently is bury the hatchet or even when I heard this on a uh, recent uh, documentary that's one of my favorites, documentaries all the time, The Last Dance with Michael Jordan and Chicago Bulls. There is on episode two where Michael Jordan references being the low man on the totem pole. Talk about his experiences joining the Bulls as a rookie. And I'm like, I wish he would have chose a different form of words to describe that as example, which leads into here, where you can. Choosing your words does matter, folks. Once again, words do matter. And instead of saying, let's have a powwow about this, I can always just say real real simple, let's meet about this. Instead of saying lowest man on the totem pole, which I just talked about, lowest rung on the ladder. And instead of saying doing a rain dance, it said hope for rain. So there's always ways, instead of uh, using maybe historical or words that we've consistently hear, have heard, many of us, we can choose our words in a good way that, that is more respectful as well as, as we just talked about just a few moments right here in terms of how our work is with our students as well as their families and us, et cetera. Which leads into back, turn it back in over to Ms. Eva. Yeah, so so in addition to, to knowing that, what wor that words do matter, it's also important to know some of the historical background of what has happened to American Indian families and nations in the past. And in, in one of those, events that still is having ongoing re repercussions to this day is the boarding schools and assimilation. Basically what happened was is that the uh, great white father or the U.S. government decided that they needed to get rid of the Indian in order to, sa to, to save the man. That it was important to take children from the various indigenous communities and to teach them how to be proper white people. However, what happened was that in many cases they were taken from their families, taken quite far away. They were punished for speaking their language. They were punished for practicing their culture. 
and they really did not get a lot of education. They instead got training for menial work, which they did for little or no compensation. And as a result, there were many children who did not survive the boarding schools. There were many children who then came home from the boarding schools and could not communicate with their families and community members. There, there were many students who came home and didn't understand or know how to practice their culture. And they essentially ended up being disconnected from their families and communities. And as a result, there is a distrust of education. The last formal boarding school that uh, of this model was closed, I believe, in 1966. So we're still de dealing with folks who were educated in that system. And I just, I've shared this story before, I did not understand the issues of the boarding schools when I was doing some of the technical assistance work that I, that I did for, uh, for various states and I was in South Dakota and we were talking about um, education and, and students and how they, you know, ways to help them do better. And the current boarding schools to, uh, to, are now tribally controlled and tribally directed. And I had several parents who were saying how, how wonderful that was because the children didn't have to deal with the stereotypes and misconceptions that their non-native peers might have and their non-native teachers. But there was also a group of uh, elders in the room who had gone through the boarding school process and they got very upset. And, and it was, and I did not know enough at that time to be able to differentiate between the two and understand why this was triggering. And it really, it, it, was a, it was a shock to me. But now that I understand, it makes more sense for me in terms of some of the distrust that we see of education that parents and communities might have. So if you go to the next one. Because education was used as a weapon to manage American Indians, some of the children grew up to parents who did not consider public education to be a positive. And honestly, we, we see those impacts still. This is probably a factor when we're looking at students who are not achieving as well as we would expect in an educational setting. So um, I will pass the next slide on to David. So as we think about this disconnection from education, so what, as it indicates on the screen, what Native American students are taught in school may contradict what they're taught in their homes and communities. And so one of the things that I always try to emphasize a lot of times is that, you know, you think about uh, representation matters, right? So books or materials that talk about the histories, cultures, and sovereignty of our indigenous nations here in Wisconsin and elsewhere, not only that is it good for indigenous students to have, but it's good for all students to have. But like a lot of times what I is, is trying to make sure that finding accurate and authentic materials that can support that instruction, both benefit for the native, individual native students as well as for their peers across our state. Obviously some resources that come to mind that I would definitely encourage folks like yourself and others to, to look at as examples to review or check out would be the DPI American Indian Studies Program website and or the Wisconsin First Nations Education websites as a couple of examples of uh, websites that have curated resources that I, we would strongly encourage you to check out as examples to find things either for P, around PD opportunities, professional development or training workshops, resources and materials, as well as other information that would find important for you to have as educators or as stakeholders in our state. The impact on Indigenous students, definitely want to uh, turn it back to Ms. Eba. Well, part of what happens is that, you know, when you're, when you're looking at instructional materials, when you're looking at information, when you're looking at historical information, looking at present day, if you don't see yourself, it tends to be a little bit less engaging. So, and, and if it contradicts the values that are promoted in your home and family and community, it tends to be less engaging. And it you, you oftentimes will see students 
that have disengaged from the educational environment during instruction. Um, next slide. So how can we re-engage students? Well, you know, we, we, teachers are required to teach to the standards. And what we want to do is make sure that it's accessible to students and teach it in a way that students can understand. And then to do this, you want to incorporate relatable aspects of, a stu of your students' daily lives into the curriculum. And uh, that could include things like, such as language, which could include jargon or slang, prior knowledge that your students have, and extracurricular interests, interests such as music and sports. David? So as we think about why culture matters, um, it as it indicates here on the screen, it permeates every aspect of ourselves as a as every aspect as as a people, as communities, and our schools, et cetera. I go down a list of many different things where it impacts our work. And so, culture sponsored practices, as example for our Indigenous students, it doesn't just Im impact their their success; it impacts all of our students. And so one of the things that I always try to talk about when I have conversations with educators is how do you define culture? What does that look like? And so one of the things that I always try to emphasize is just breaking it down by its root, by a root basis is that culture to me, something I learned from a very influential elder a long time ago is that culture is relationship or relationships, singular or plural, plus meaning. And that understanding that culture, we as individuals have multiple cultures, not a culture that impacts us in terms of who we are and how we relate to other folks as example. And so for me, I have, you know, I'm Anishinaabe, that's one aspect of my culture. I have other cultures that make up David. I'm an educator, I've, that's a culture. Being a parent is being a culture. I got a list of many different things that define who, who David is or Bagwagani would, in this case, as example, in terms of my relationship with the greater world around me. And so when you think about teaching culturally, that's the one thing that I always try to drive home more than anything, is that um, one thing I always see in schools or in areas is that we feel more comfortable teaching about cultures versus teaching culturally. And to me, those are big there's big differences between those two. So when I think about teaching about cultures, that's about learning about the foods, festivities, heroes, and holidays. That's that very surface level. When you think about teaching culturally, it's where you as an educator, not just a teacher, but you as an educator, it can be administrator, student services, whatever the case may be, where you become active guy with your students, meaning you learn with them. When I think about back to my best experiences growing up, <clears throat> the teachers I had the best rapport with, especially my K-5 education as example, were those individuals that helped me develop into the student I was, but at the same time, they learned from me. And so when I think about those opportunities, it's a golden opportunity for that educator to grow their practice from having an opportunity to learn from their students, but not at the same time, not putting all that burden, say, hey, David, teach about your native cultures or whatever the case may be. That's not what I'm trying to say. It's where it's that reciprocation of that balance of where you are actively learning and they are learning with you as well. So with that being so, said, turn it back over to Ms. Eva. Yep. And, and this, the figure on the slide is supposed to be someone taking a selfie. Uh, in order to help educators better understand a student, I gave you the example of um, the, the fact that educators were seeing disconnections between what test scores the student was getting on some of the standardized tests and what they knew the student could do because of their real life experience with them. You know, IDEA, the law that governs, uh, the federal law that governs special education, requires that we not, no student should be identified as having a disability based on one measure. It's important to use multiple measures so that we can get the best possible idea of who that student is. So, for example, you know, you might be educators might be working with parents to better understand the student and how the student is in their classroom and how the student is at home. Um, I always made sure that I asked the student themselves, you know, what do you think is going on? What helps you? What What do you want to be when you when you finish high school? All of those things gave me a better picture of who the student was. Whenever 
um, possible involving the student deciding how to best demonstrate learning. I had one student who knew that he had a hard time um, staying focused unless he was by himself in, in a room. And he told me, he said, you know, if you're, if, I will do better if I'm just with you than if, I, than if I'm trying to show you something in the classroom. And that was a really insightful thing for that student to be able to, to, to do. And students do, do tend to have that understanding. It's just nobody asks nobody. We often forget to ask them their opinion. So using multiple methods to assess learning, we don't want to just do standardized assessments. We want to make sure that we do things such as uh, observations in various settings, that we do some interviews with both the student, the parent, and educators, make sure that we're using these different ways of understanding the student to get the most comprehensive picture, get a 3D image rather than a flat 2, 2D photograph. And also being employing universal design strategies. There are certain things that can be done in a classroom that will benefit every student. Uh, matter of fact, the you know there are phys physically universal design strategies came originally from some of the architecture used to make buildings accessible. You know we we know that um, I know I before I ended up having a disability I still found the cuts in the sidewalks to be helpful for me because especially if I had a rolling bag with me it just made it easier than having to keep lifting it up. So there are certain things that we can do for every student to try and eliminate barriers that don't need to be there. Um, next slide please. So, and then continuing on beyond that point is also developing relationships with students, their parents and families. Getting, to, so like I said, getting to know them so well that the teacher can tell when the test results don't match student abilities. Not blaming the student or parents, addressing the difficulty rather than casting blame. That's especially important. You know, I, that, that's one disconnection I have with some, some of the ways that we approach special education because as I told students, it's not their fault that they're that they are an Apple-based operating system in a world of PCs. You know, we it's up to us to develop a program to to accommodate that difference. But we also need to make sure that we have high expectations. That just because we know that the student has a learning disability doesn't mean that we expect them to be less academically successful. And recognizing strengths rather than focusing on perceived weakness. I, I, mean, I had students who loved being able to talk about what they were good at because they felt like all they ever talked about was what they were bad at or what they were doing wrong. And then all of us, and this equals native, non-native, uh, all of us have biases and stereotypes because we all tend to consume the same media uh, programming. We were taught from similar books. Those stereotypes and biases were, were are built into our, our education system. But when we recognize the biases and stereotypes um, and that are continually re reinforced, then we can combat them and, and move on to better understand the student themselves. So how does this, maybe you could go to the next one, how does this all connect to Native families? Those of you who are here as parents, you can help your students um, educators better understand what goes in uh, what goes on in the home community, especially focusing on strengths and interests. Uh, you can also help um, educators understand why your child does what they do. I had a really uh, wonderful student at one point who uh, he 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 scored up to seven in a, as a 17 year old's level of knowledge of science when he was in first grade. And yet his teacher refused to let him participate in a more advanced science um, instruction because he couldn't read and felt that until he could read, he didn't deserve to be able to, to um, explore science beyond his reading level. And that and then he and then they started to see things like, well, if his the student would fall out of his chair. Nobody thought to ask the student why until I did. And I said, because he wanted to see what would happen. So here was a student who was being denied the exploration of, of science, which was his great interest because of his reading disability. And 
So he was going to figure out a way to incorporate it, even if his teacher didn't. And uh, you know, and I think that that's really important that we don't penalize students for for what we think they should be able to do. Going back to that whole issue of respect, if families see you treating them with respect, they will be more likely to collaborate with you. You'll be the exception. You, unfortunately, you may be the exception to the rule, but at least you'll have that connection. And if you don't know any, something about the culture, your American Indian families may be able to connect you with someone who can help. And in the end, when students see you treating their family with respect and interest in their lives, they're more likely to form a connection with you and be more engaged in their instruction. And for students with IEPs, that may mean that they, you know, it's not going to necessarily make things easier. But we know that when students are engaged, that we get, they're they're more likely to take in some of the the accommodations, understand the modifications they need, become more independent when it comes to um, determining what they need to do. All of these things are important, and we as educators, uh, we as parents and family members, need to model that for them. Now I'll turn it back on to David. As you heard me talk about through all folks, you know, our state of Wisconsin, we are home to 12 nations. And so I so wanted to kind of show you the flags or logos of each of these nations across our state. Um, as I mentioned, 11 of those are uh, our nations are fairly recognized as well as one is not fairly and they're state recognized. But I always tell people tribal communities live across our state everywhere. So regardless of the community that you have or live in, even if it's adjacent to a reservation or a tribal community, you may, I always tell people you have residents or individuals that call those places home. And so every county in Wisconsin, every almost every school across Wisconsin has at least one or if not more indigenous or native students enrolled in your district. And so when you think about a great opportunity to serve those students would be a good opportunity for you as educators to get to know a little bit more about those nations that they come from, or they may be from nations outside of our state as well. So good enough, a good number of our indigenous people that live in Wisconsin, maybe from other nations, like from like they may be identified as being Diné or Lakota or whatever nation they've specifically, but has called Wisconsin home for a while now. And many in many cases, maybe their parents or grandparents, as example, um, have called the state of Wisconsin home for a long time, as exa and as example. As I talked about earlier, folks, a couple websites or resources which I would, we would strongly encourage you to check out. I talked about two of those early on, the DPI American Indian Studies Program website, as well as the Wisconsin First Nations website. These are two uh, area websites that we would strongly encourage you to check out, as well as some of our, our strong partners that even I have with some of our associations here in the state, which also includes the Wisconsin Indian Education Association website, also known as WIEA as well as the National Indian Education Association website, also known as NIEA. So here's a couple of good examples of some links or resources, which we would strongly encourage you to check out as examples to help support your own learning, as well as the learning of your students. Um, real quick in terms of, as I mentioned early on, um, if you look under specifically under the professional development training opportunities, when you go to my website, the DPI American Indian Studies Program website, Specifically, you go to the calendar of events section. They'll talk about different resources, or different trainings, or professional oppor development opportunities you can partake in throughout the year. Uh, one examples of those you can we have uh, monthly webinars where we actually have guest speakers from from November all the way through the end of June have an opportunity to talk about different topics or, or areas of issues that we'd like to have be aware of. We also have our online study circles where you actually, if you are a participant. Um, all you gotta do is register for it and you have to attend an orientation and attend three sessions and get a free book. I always say that's a great investment in terms of your time and have an opportunity to learn with other stakeholders across our state where you may be from Superior, but you may be learning with someone from Milwaukee or Green Bay, Rylander, Platteville, Wassa, Eau Claire, or all those amazing cities or towns in between across our state. And in terms of connecting with us, here is our contact information. Both Ema Stevie Kobinski, um, as, you can see, as she talked about earlier, she's our school administration consultant here on the special education team. And in terms of my role, I'm the American Indian Studies consultant on the teaching learning team, as well as the special education team. And you can see our contact information. Mm -hmm. But definitely wanted to have an opportunity to open up for some questions. And I know our moderator is going to um, help answer those or help uh, share those with us for us to address or answer as well.
Yeah, thank you, David. I do have a couple of questions um, that uh, I would hope that you'd be able to take a look at for us. The first one is that um, the person who wrote their question said that um, they were really impressed with the slide that you had on language and how language matters. But the concern that they have is how to let others know that language truly matters. How can you tell someone else who is using some of um, the poor language to describe individuals um, to change their behavior to make it more language appropriate? That's a good. That's a great question, and I'll definitely um, have Eva chime in in that as well. I'll give her context because her and I have these conversations quite a bit. Mm -hmm. Sometimes you got to model that first. Yes. Right? So like if you're if you're modeling it constantly, and and if you're in no space, especially if you have a relationship with these individual individual or individuals, where you are modeling for from time to time for them, and they're still not picking up, that's one thing. So like as an example. Um, something that I have worked on very hard in my language um, is moving away from saying you guys and, mm -hmm. so, and be, rather be more inclusive language and say folks or colleagues. And it's been something I've had to work on a very long time. And so another term that I always use is tribe versus nation. I always say nation. I think nation and tribe have a very different context and meaning behind them. And I think nation, that's, you know, as example, um, talks about that government to government relationship between like, either our nations in Wisconsin and the state government and or the federal government as an example. And so for me, one, step one is modeling. Step two, then it's, and it's having an honest conversation with those individuals. I always tell people, if you recognize that there's an issue and you're not saying anything, then you're also part of the problem because mm -hmm. you're allowing it. So if someone is saying things um, that are considered deemed inappropriate or whatever case may be, I would have an honest conversation. I wouldn't come in and the one thing is always approach it from not having to go into defense mode because mm -hmm. that's usually the first thing that po our, we as human beings are in, as is, is our response to go to. But I think is if you think about those relationships or rapport that you build up, if you can have at least, if you have an honest dialogue, at least that, if, at least that person listens to what you'd say. They may not hear everything you're saying, but at least listens. That's a win to me. And but to me, I think, you know, it's also as you think about over time, how they move in their own practice, because I don't expect someone to change their practice with a snap of a finger. But if you look at if you look at increments or building up over time where you see ch positive changes, that to me is the win. And so I, what I'm trying to tell people is you got to you have to invest time and effort in that then, mm -hmm. because it's not going to change overnight. And it's and if because at the same I always remind people as someone who's went through the same education system like many of us have, I have had mm -hmm. to unpack and unlearn a lot of stuff myself even learning about, understand what indigenous people are. And I'm an indigenous person myself. And so that's something, uh, some of the things I always look at as examples of how you move this work forward in a good way, in the right way. And so for me, it's the small steps that make a big impact later on, I always say. But I'm gonna throw it to Eva and have her weigh in as well. <laughs> yeah, this keeps reminding me of family gatherings and, uh, you know, the struggle between, you know, rippling, you know, causing causing waves versus letting something be perpetuated. And one of the things that I've seen modeled is just saying, ouch, that phrase, that seems, I'm really uncomfortable with using that phrase. Could you please use another phrase and maybe even give them another phrase in place of that one? And, uh, you know, and again, that way it's, they understand why you're not, you know, just say, you're putting on yourself, it makes me uncomfortable. Can I ask you to consider using this? And I've seen that change. I've also been laughed at by my family members when I've done something like that, but I did notice that after that, they stopped using the phrase that, that I found uncomfortable. So that's just been one strategy that I've had, but yeah, this comes up in my family you know, a lot because not everybody is coming from having the opportunity to explore their own biases and stereotypes. And they don't even, they're not even aware that this is, of, of, of how this might impact. So thank you for the question. That was a really great one. Bonnie, is there another one? 
Yes, I do have another one um, that's related in some ways, but the person who posed this says that they don't want to make this uh, anything that has to do with political kinds of things, but they mm -hmm. said that um, they'd like to have you talk a, a little bit more on teaching culturally, because the concern that they have is that um, in the atmosphere that we have now and with the interference of a lot of people into what people teach in schools, how can you have people buy into teaching culturally? That's a I great question. That's, mm -hmm. that's actually a question. Um, I'm gonna let Eva start this off and I'll, and I'll add on as needed. Yeah, you know, I think, it, I, you know, there's a lot of people who kind of mix up things in terms of what they are and what's actually happening in the schools. And part of that is just providing education that, you know what, teaching culturally isn't necessarily going in and saying, you know, this, you know, bad United States, look at all these things that you did, but to say here, we need to understand our entire history and not our, you know, and not just the history that we're comfortable with. And, you know, if, if you can lead them through that, if they're willing to hear that, then that's that's really a great way, too. But again, the other thing is the focus that David said. This is to be the guide at the side of the student. This is not to be the lecturer talking about, you know, A, B, and C, but allowing the students to, to explore and ask their own questions and helping them figure out how to get those answers. David? So one thing I add, you know, I, when I think about teaching culturally, I think back to an amazing educators I've had in my life. And one educator stands up out of the rest. So it was my second grade teacher from uh, 1989 to 1990. She was doing teaching culturally before that was even a thought that I, that mm -hmm. I myself and others um, work with the educators on. So what I'm trying to say is you can label things all you want but it's just act, it's the act of practices themselves so what i'm trying to say is that like when i think about teaching culturally there's a couple of things that come to mind right away um the pedagogical practices that we have all the time so that includes utilizing moral histories and stories now that may that's now you're that's i'm not calling it i'm not giving it a label i'm just doing it right so like as when i think about oral histories or stories every one of us has a story Mm -hmm. Right, you as individuals, every one of us, every time our students walk in that door, they have a story or stories that's part of their life. And then, you know, for me, we just talked about it earlier the understanding of personal sovereignty. Like, we talked about what sovereignty is, but I would always like to remind people we as, we as individuals have personal sovereignty as well. So, when I wake up in the morning, yeah, I'm confined by certain things I need to be at work at a certain time or whatever the case may be, but I can choose what I eat, I can choose what I read, I can choose what I want, you know, all these different things. That's exercising personal sovereignty as example. I always think about like, applying experimental uh, learning techniques and opportunities, having students think about things that they they know every day, but also things that they may not. Other ways I always think about is, you know, I always think about it's, a, it's a, making sure that that support around social emotional awareness, things that we've been talking about, especially around uh, mental health and other different things across our state. Also thinking about how the understanding of our classroom community reflects the greater community that we live in. So yeah, it's it's one thing to prepare our students for our front, our backyard, but we also got to prepare for the bigger world around them as well. And last but not least, I always tell tree people when I think about teaching culturally, it's a growth mindset. Understanding that your practice, what it looked like 10 years ago may look like, like very different from today or even a year ago. And I always look at those experiences as growing opportunities, not only for the benefit of yourself, but for the benefit of your students as well that you work with. And so those are just a couple of quick things that come to mind when I think about teaching culturally that you don't even have to get into the facts of talking about politics or different things. It's just that when we start adding labels to things, that's how it gets uh, picked up and put into different areas. But for me, teaching culturally, it's just good for all students and families and communities, mm -hmm. as well as our nations that we work with. Agreed. Well, Eva and David, that's all the questions that we have at this point. Do either of you or both of you have some sort of summation that you'd like to say or final comment? Certainly. Um, I'll extend it to Eva first, unless I, otherwise I'll sure. go, Eva. No, I, I think that I, the message I hope that you all are getting from this is that if you really want 
to to see help students become their very best you have to see them and you have to look at them for who and and listen to what they're telling you rather than assuming that you know and that makes a huge difference in terms of how you're how you're going to teach how you're going to do your practice and um, and then that I think is a family's role too is to help their child's teachers better understand their child so if that's the only thing you take from this I will be happy David yeah just to build on that you know um, one of the things I always try to instill in this conversation is that you know a lot of this work that we've been talking about throughout our time here today it's it's good for all students period mm -hmm. and one of the main things I want to drive home is that like 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 Eva just talked about is that the ones that I and I always try to tell people when you think about those teachers or educators that made a had a big different made a big impact in your life think back to why they did and to me it was the relationships I have with them mm -hmm. the ones I struggle with I didn't have any relationship with them period and mm -hmm. I'm not trying to say that you should know everything about my background that's impossible what I'm trying to say is if you should, the effort shown the opportunities to grow and understand things differently over time makes a big world of difference. I mean, I still have people to this day tell me this, and I'm always shocked when I hear it. I have friends of mine who are, I'm 40 years old, and they'll say, David, you know, the only time I ever remember going out to the reservation in my entire life is that time that Miss So-and-so took us out there in second grade to visit with different speakers from your community and others. He said, the only time I ever been through your go through your reservation growing up was driving through it and driving back through it. Other than maybe going to stopping at the local gas station and or stopping at the gaming establishment that you have. That's it. Now I'm like, you're 40 years old and that's the only, and you live here your whole life and you still live here. That's the only time you've ever been out to uh, my nation as example. That's really like, really sets the tone in conversations moving forward very differently. And so one of the things I even just talked to with the school district this past week where I did a full day training around teaching culturally as example. One thing I tried, I tried uh, uh, talking to them about, I said, how many of you have ever visited your nations or your communities that, that you serve? And none of them rose their hand out of almost 100 people in there. That is, other than the one person who was a tribal member said that, yes, I have. And I said, well, you not only have one tribal community or two, two, two nations near, near you, but you also have surrounding other non-native communities. How many ever visited them? And none of them said that raised man other than living there. I think that's a lost opportunity. If you're truly going to serve a, 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 a community or people, you should at least under have an opportunity to continually and actively, not just one time, but continue and actively have an opportunity to learn with them. And I want to emphasize with them because Mm -hmm. It's not like you talk to them or vice versa. You learn with each other. That's that's a huge opportunity to grow your practice, both as an individual as well as a as an educator itself. But with that being said, folks, I want to say on behalf of the Wisconsin Department of Public Construction, I, uh, Dr. Jill Underley, our state superintendent, I just want to say miigwech, which is Ojibwe for thank you for all that you do for our students, our families, our communities, as well as our nations. And so on behalf of of uh, both myself and Eva, I just want to say that big shout out to Wisconsin Facets for this opportunity to be in this space to yes, learn with you as well. So thank you everyone. Sure, and I just want to uh, make a comment that one of our participants did and she actually used the same word that you did in saying thank you. And um, she said that thank you to her most inspirational teachers. She appreciated your great answer and will definitely use the information. So I thank you both so very much, both David and Eva for your participation today. I know that I learned a tremendous amount and I know that those those who participated did as well. So this will conclude our webinar today. Thank you all for joining us. Please be reminded that Wisconsin Facets has over 100 trainings and webinars for the year 2022. And please feel free to check out our website calendar and register for any of the upcoming trainings that may be of interest to you. Again, watch for that short evaluation that will be coming your way after today's live presentation. Again, thank you to Eva and to David, and thank you all for joining us. Bye-bye, everybody. Goodbye. Take care, everyone.